Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Anna Balog, and this is the first segment of a new uh, YouTube video sequence on the historical geology uh, course at Virginia Western Community College. Let's start with the first module, the geologic time. As you probably understand, historical geology should start with the geologic time because in this module, we're going to talk about how old the Earth is, how do we get to know the Earth age. Uh, we're going to compare the relative age and the absolute age dating. So we're going to learn a lot of interesting things here. So the, let's uh, begin with the early concept about geologic time and the age of the Earth. This is time before absolute age dating, which we do right now. So the first person we have to mention is James Asher. James Asher lived between 1580 and 1655. He was about 75 at that time. That was a long life, I believe. He was one of the greatest scholars and theologian of his time. He was skilled linguist, so he could read the Bible biblical text in the original language, which is the biblical Hebrew. Being able to read the, the biblical text helped him to create a timeline of events using both knowledge and simple math by basically using genealogy to calculate important dates. And then he published those important dates in his book, which is called Annals of the World, and he published it 1658. Of course, I won't ask the date, so don't worry about it. Just know what he did. So the first most important calculation he did is basically the age of the Earth. Based on his calculation, Earth was created on Sunday, October the 23rd, 4004 BC. So that's a crazy calculation if you think about it. October 23rd on a Sunday. October 4, 4004 BC. I mean, isn't that a crazy calculation? What do you think? It's interesting anyhow. That puts the age of the Earth to about 6,000 years. He also calculated other dates of, of different biblical events, such as, to me, that's really interesting that Adam and Eve were driven from paradise on Monday, November 10th, 4004 BC. And I just realized that based on his calculations, Adam and Eve were in paradise only for two weeks and 18 days. That's really not a long time. And, and it's really interesting to, to see. The other kind of interesting event he calculated is the Noah Ark, you know, the big flood, Noah's flood. And he built the ark with all the animals in it. And that touched down on Mount Ararat on May 5th, 1491. BC on events. There are a couple of other dates here, which of course I would never ask, but so you can see some interesting times. So the, his calculation provided sweeping biblical explanation for most questions about biological diversity for the longest time, for hundreds of years. So first of all, the creation, which is the idea that all creatures have been created independently of one another by God and organized into a hierarchy which is a chain, chain of being, with man basically right under God. So we are more important than anything on earth except for God. The other thing which really shut down every kind of thinking was the 6,000 year limit of the age of the earth. So it wasn't the average person who would have questioned the, how old is the earth. So during the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries, there were some attempts. Some people tried to calculate the age of the earth, like looking at scientifically, uh, not just the revelation from the Bible. Although some attempts were ingenious, they yielded a variety of ages that we now know that it's much younger than the reality. So the first person we should talk about just a little bit is Nicolas Stino. He was basic father of stratigraphy. We're going to learn more about that later. He was working on the formation of rock layers and the fossils, and he was crucial in the development of modern geology. Nicholas Steno, or Neil Stiesen, was a Danish scientist and pioneer in both anatomy and geology. He converted to Catholicism later in life and became a bishop. This is a short biography of his life. He was born in 1638 to a Lutheran family in Copenhagen. When he was 19, he entered university to pursue medical studies. He later became a professor of anatomy and made several notable discoveries related to the parotid or Stenson duct, the nature of the heart, and the nature of muscular contracture. 
In 1666, Steenson began to question the nature of fossils after dissecting the head of a large female shark. The shark's teeth looked similar to objects sometimes found inside rocks, but he questioned how a solid object could end up inside another solid object. Steenson's studies culminated in his Dissertationis Prodromus of 1669, wherein he described the four principles of stratigraphy. Throughout this time, Steenson was questioning his religious views. He started reading the Church Fathers and feeling drawn to Catholicism. Steenson converted to Catholicism and was ordained a priest shortly later. He became one of the leading figures of the Counter-Reformation and a bishop. He continued to study the brain and nervous system while frequently dressing like a poor man and driving in an open carriage in bad weather. This, combined with his poor diet, led to health problems. Steenson died in 1686 at the age of 48. He is considered one of the founders of modern geology. He was beatified in 1988 and his feast day is December 5th. He is considered by some to be a patron of the geosciences. These are the principles we still use, which was uh, established by him. The first one is the superposition. The next one is the original horizontality and then the lateral continuity. I'm going to have a whole section on, on the principles, so let's go further now. The next person I want you to know about is George and all those names, Buffon. So if you just know George Buffon, it's good. He lived between 1707 and 1788. He assumed that the Earth had originally been a molten mass and had gradually cooled down over time. He conducted a series of experiments with melting cannonballs and cooling them down slowly. Of course, this is an interesting concept to think about how slowly did he cool it down? Did he cool it down really fast or very slow or even slower? So based on the cooling down rate, he could get different ages. So by observing all these, he came up with the age of the Earth to be 75,000 years. This was a radical departure from the 6,000 years, though. But he was a little bit scared of his findings. So later, he even suggested that it could be as old as 3 million. Probably he thought of the cooling grade, and that's why he came up with older age. And he didn't publish that at all, because probably he was a little bit scared of the church. The next scientist I want you to know about, probably he's the most important one. His name is James Hutt and he lived between 1726 and 1797. We consider him the father of historical geology. He was an amazing person. He came up with a bunch of uh, principles we still use. I want you to watch this movie about him. This is a story of James Hutton, the father of modern geology and the development of deep time. Before 1788, the consensus in science was that the world was 6,000 years old. In fact, the precise date of creation had been determined by Bishop Usher of Ireland through a scholarly analysis of the Bible to be October 22nd, 4004 BC. Even Sir Isaac Newton, the father of modern science, had repeated the analysis with similar results. At the University of Edinburgh, a professor who had known Isaac Newton instilled in the young James Hutton Newton's rules for scientific study, including if observations or experimental evidence conflicts with theory, then the theory must be changed to fit the facts. After completing his medical studies, Hutton turned to farming, which gave him a chance to examine the Earth's surface in detail. Later in life, he moved back to Edinburgh, where he became involved in the management of building the Forth and Clyde Canal both an application of his geological knowledge and a chance to study more of the surface of the earth. Not far from Edinburgh Castle in Holyrood Park, James found what is now called Hutton's Section, the most famous geological site in Edinburgh. The reigning theory at this time proposed that rocks had precipitated from the early ocean that once covered the earth. But here Hutton found a slab of sedimentary rock that had been torn away during the injection of magma from below, and then hardening to form the dolerite structure known as Salisbury Crags. This was a clear example of the junction between the younger igneous rock and the much older underlying sedimentary rocks. This evidence that some rocks must have formed from molten liquids 
was a direct challenge to the reigning theory. But Hutton needed to find proof that the Earth was really old in order to convince any of his associates. To this end, Hutton and two of his closest associates set out in a boat to explore the coast of Scotland, and it was at Sikar Point that he found what he was looking for. Here we follow a trail dedicated to Hutton with our geologist guide, Angus Miller. This is so important uh, uh, for Hutton uh, because it was so much better than anything he'd seen before. Uh, so what we've got is the grey wacky sandstone on the right hand side you can see that the layers are standing, standing up, up on end uh -huh. uh, and that is because after they were formed they were subject to plate tectonics, they were folded up and uh, shoved up into these very steep sided uh, layers. Uh, and then erosion had taken hold and it started to work away uh, the grey wacky layers uh, and then conditions changed and the red sandstone started to accumulate here. So there's still red sandstone lying on the left hand side all the way across the, the much flatter lying layers. The lower parts of it has got barnacles on it. Uh, mm. Darwin would have appreciated that, I'm sure, <laughs> if he ever came here. <laughs> but uh, it's got, so, so uh, it's, uh, the colour changes, but it's the red sandstone. And uh, what uh, Hutton realised is when they saw it here was that there was a variation in the surface of the unconformity that the grey wacky, when it was being worn away, was subject to natural forces uh, and it was uh, the harder stuff was surviving better than the softer stuff. So there was actually an existing topography that was buried by the red sandstone accumulating on top of it. Yeah. So way over to the left hand side you see more of the grey wacky yeah. just sticking up through the layers of red sandstone and that's one of, one of, one of the, the things that uh, James Hall picked out in his sketch uh, that uh, the harder layers stick up. Uh, the other thing that Hutton saw here for the first, first time, time and was very pleased about was the lowest layers of the red sandstone have got chunks of the older sandstone embedded in them. So this is important for him in terms of showing the progression of, of, of different episodes that had formed this. And, uh, a series of chapters of the story. It didn't all happen at once. Um, it was uh, There was no need for uh, any... Uh, for the upper, higher power, he described, no, no need for a higher power to explain this. It could be explained by the processes of the Earth. You just needed time. Uh, and so he picked out the fact that there would have been the original accumulation of the grey rocks and then deformation of them. Uh, so they've been squashed uh, from north to south uh, and the, the, like compressing a carpet. Uh, so it built up into mm -hmm. these a whole series of, of steep sided. Uh, uh, folds, so that's set two and then the next chapter is erosion of that existing rock uh, so it starts to wear away and we get a, a dry land here with uh, ridges and valleys uh, and mm. then uh, step four is the accumulation of the red sandstones and most of the red sandstone is derived from material that's come from the north so mm. the time it was forming on the horizon to the north would have been proper mountains. You'll go through the highlands, you'll see the highlands. They're, they're impressive, but they're not high. Uh, and if we go back 400 million years to when the red sandstone was forming, that would have been a towering mountain range, a Himalayan scale mm. mountain range on the, on the horizon there. And that was uh, re eroding and material was being swept down here. So it started to accumulate here. Uh, and then stage five is that the, the red sandstone itself has had a slight tectonic deformation as well. Not nearly as severe as the earlier rock. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's, it's tilted out towards the sea at a low angle. And then finally we're in stage six, chapter six of the story, erosion. Is, is going on. It's been going on here for millions of years uh, and it's stripped away what was a huge uh, amount of red sandstone that accumulated above this point. Uh, it gradually worked its way. The seas come in here and it's helped in the erosion uh, and we're at this stage now where the very last bits of the red sandstone are clinging on on top mm -hmm. of the, of the grey uh, and it's still visible. So this was... Uh, even certainly one of the most significant events in, in the development of uh, geological thought that, that day the three of them came here in 1788. Mayfair was a person that really described it uh, particularly well. We're carried back in time to when the rock in which you stood was at the bottom of the sea and the sandstone before it was yet beginning to be deposited. The mind seemed to grow giddy by looking so far into the abyss of time. Mm. So they got it. Playfair got it. Hutton jumped around in the rocks and told them the story. 
uh, and uh, play fair the light bulb moment for him he, mm. he saw what Adam was talking about he understood the immensity of it and this the bit at the, the end that they said it made the game sensible how much further reason may sometimes go than imagination may venture to follow uh, so he was saying really that this was the the scientific facts presented yeah. by Hutton the series of events it was unbelievable but it was backed up by the evidence yeah. after the trip to Sicker Point Hutton's paper was published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society but his work didn't become widely known until after his death, when one of his companions on that trip, John Playfair, publicized Hutton's ideas in a book entitled Illustration of Hutton's Theory of the Earth. Charles Lyell, who was born eight months after Hutton died, went on to expand on Hutton's ideas and wrote The Principles of Geology, which became the standard geology text for the next 100 years. Charles Darwin brought a copy of Lyle's book along on the voyage of the Beagle, and this helped shape his thinking with Hutton's theory allowing the time necessary for natural selection to work. Back to the initial question, how old is the Earth? Hutton's answer was, we find no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end. As science progressed, we have developed the tools to estimate the Earth to be 4.5 billion years old. We have taken the walk to learn about Hutton and how he began to convince the world about... So the principles James Hutton come up with is the principle of cross-cutting relationships, the principle of inclusion, and the most important one is the principle of uniformitarianism. It's a hard word to say. You just have to practice it some. So principle of uniformitarianism. 